I want to tell you the true story as to why I'm here. Don called me about um, six months ago and he said, do you believe in free speech? And I was a little offended by the question, of course. I'm an academic, I believe in free speech. And he said, well, come to Optus Club and give one. <laughs> Now I'm going to tell you the true story, okay? Um, this really comes from my heart, okay? Can you hear me okay way back in there? Not as well. Not as well. Okay, well, we'll do something a little bit different here. Let's get organized. Um, um, this is a true story, okay? Um, uh, the club was just getting started, just barely getting started. And Don called me up, and I'd never met him, but I knew his wonderful, wonderful reputation. And he said, we're starting an Optimus Club. And he said, we'd like to have you come and speak. And he said, now there's going to be relatively few people there. I got to tell you that, relatively few. But he said, and I'll never forget it, we've got great plans for this club. And Don, um, I can't say enough for your wonderful, wonderful leadership. You will always be our founding father. And if all of you agree with that, say amen. <laughs> well, it was about a year ago. My wife, Karen, who was here, um, um, and I were at a, at a Christmas social. And a woman came up to me, and we just started talking. What do you do? What do I do? And I said, well, I taught at the University of Minnesota for 34 years. And um, she says, well, well, what's your field? I said, well, my field is health management and communication uh, studies. And she says, well, that's interesting. She says, tell me, what have you learned from your students? Not what did you teach, but what have you learned from your students? And so what I want to do for the next half hour is just kind of share with you the things that I have learned from my students over a 34-year career. But I'm going to focus on the millennials, all right? So I'm going to focus on the students who are between 20 and 30. Now, there's a great difference between a millennial is 30 and a millennial is 20. But for the sake of our discussion here, I'm going to lump them together. And I'm going to share with you what I have learned from them. Now, in a nutshell, before we get into the content, I would say that the millennials, I am more optimistic about this group, this age group, than any group of students I have taught. I have taught four generations of students, which will tell you a little bit how old I am. And each one, the baby booners, the uh, generation Xers, they all had something to contribute. But I want to tell you, I am so optimistic about the youth about the youth. What I'm optimistic about is their technology skills. Now that's kind of yesterday's news. We all know that the young ones, you know, no technology. Those of you who are tending to be a little bit older may go to your grandkids for advice on your iPhone and your iPad all the time. But it's not that they know how to use an iPhone. They know how to search for information. They know how to problem solve, and they know how to use technology in order to problem solve. And so some of you may remember, if you went to the University of Minnesota, that when you had to write a paper, you went back into the library stacks. Remember that? You talk to a millennial and say, stacks? What in the world are you talking about? Stacks? What in the world does that mean? Well, it meant you went back into the library in the dusty bin, and you brought out a whole bunch of books. Well, that day is over. And what I've learned is that this new generation can use the computer like a whiz, far better than many of us in this room. They can problem solve. I'm excited about this new generation because they are really prepared for college like never, ever before. 25 years ago, we would sit around as faculty and talk about how are we going to get the young people up to speed so that their spelling is right and that they can write papers. I want to tell you that day is pretty much over. What's happening in high schools across this country is absolutely amazing in terms of helping students learn technology, helping students learn critical thinking skills, 
helping students have international learning opportunities. And so the young people <clears throat> that are 20 to 30 are really people that are preparing themselves for the world. And then I would say it has been such a pleasure teaching them because I find in general tremendous values of service. Now, that doesn't mean that the greatest generation ever didn't have values of service. They certainly did. It doesn't men mention or negate those that um, are baby boomers. They certainly had that urge. But I sense in this younger generation that they really do want to serve. And it doesn't matter whether they're talking about nonprofit organizations like public health or whether they're going into business for themselves or whether they're going to work for companies. I find that there is an ethic in many of them about wanting to serve. Now, they've got a long ways to go before they'll be the greatest generation ever, a long ways to go. There are problems with this 20 to 30-year-old group. One of the problems is depression. We find that depression amongst this group is very, very high. The suicide rate is stable, but it is alarming. I have found in my own experience that these young people aren't nearly as resilient as the baby boomers. I find that if you criticize them, they take it personally. I find that if you say something negative, it's kind of like the end of the world. And so I don't want to make this generation of students so great that we don't understand some of their limitations because they're there. But I would say overall, this has the possibility of being the greatest generation of young people ever. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this topic with you is that some of you have children, adult children, who are in the 20 to 30 year age range. Some of you are grandparents to 20 to 30 year old children. Many of you are working, you supervise millennials. And in our communities and in our organizations everywhere, we are near millennials. And so what I'm hoping to do is to not only just kind of just give some superficialities about the millennials, I want to dig deep and tell you what I have learned after teaching them for 34 years. The very first thing that I've learned again and again and again is that this generation has the possibility of being very, very creative. I have found that when you give them an assignment and you say, you're turned loose, do with it what you want, that they come back with very interesting results that I haven't seen in previous generations. It seems like creativity is born within them. It's in them. They want to be creative. And they want that creative license to come out. And it is so important for those of you who supervise millennials that you let them be creative, that you let them, that you let them shine, you let them express their opinions. But it seems to be right within the core of them. Um, I was teaching a course called Speech Five, and there were about 50 students in the class. <clears throat> and uh, I'll never forget, I tried to get to class early um, just to get everything ready. And I came in, and here was a young man and he was right in the front of the room, and he was dressed up to kill. I mean, he had a sport coat on, he had a, his, his a nice tie on, a white shirt, and I just nodded to him, I said hi, and I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And as I was walking by, though, I noticed that on the top of his notebook, he put down speech five, Professor Veninga. And as I looked at that, I thought to myself, is that just a coincidence that this happened? And so the next class I came and there he was early again, dressed up to kill. He looked like he was coming out of the Esquire magazine. And I said, hi, how you doing? Oh, he says, I'm doing great. He says, I really appreciated that first class. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Well, the third class I came and there he was all dressed up. And finally, I couldn't resist. I said, can you tell me who you are? And he says, I'm a freshman from Grundy Center, Iowa. Anybody know about Grundy Center, Iowa? Some of you know Grundy Center, Iowa. It's near Applington, Iowa, where I was raised. And so we played, our schools played basketball together, and we had a great time. And I says, I don't get it. You're here, and you look like a million bucks, and you're here early, and you're taking notes. I said, what's the drill here for you? And he smiled, and he says, well, sir, I'm hoping to get to know you. 
and I'm hoping that I do well in this class, and if I do well, I am hoping that in four years from now, you will give me a letter of recommendation. <laughs> How is that for creativity? I said to him, you do well in this class and you do well in your academic program, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. Four years later, there was a knock at my door. Here was this young man. He says, do you remember me? I said, I sure do. I, he says, will you write me a letter of recommendation? I said, well, how have you done? He says, I'm cum laude. I says, I'll write the letter of recommendation. It was to a graduate school. He got accepted into a prestigious graduate school. Two years later, he was getting his master's degree, and he wrote me a letter from the school out in the East Coast, and he said, will you write another letter of recommendation for me? <laughs> Indeed, I did. And the last I heard, he was an executive of a major healthcare organization. What we do know about this group of people is that they're creative. Now folks, this is terribly important. We tend to think that as we grow old, we lose our creativity. I want to tell you, that ain't true. That is not true. Now it is true that when you look at patents, it tends to be 30 and 40 year olds who get the patents, but it doesn't mean that when you grow old, you cannot be creative. I heard a story the other day that illustrates this point, whether it's apocryphal or true, I do not know. But this is a story uh, after World War II. The United States government was really concerned about the fact that people were turning against nuclear power. And at that point in time, we needed to have nuclear power facilities. So they hired a rather famous professor. And they gave him a chauffeur. And he was to give a whole series of speeches across the country, across the country. And so the chauffeur and him, one night of speech, another night of speech, another night of speech. And they got out to Colorado, and he was going to, supposed to be delivering the most important speech of them all. It was to a group of scientists, a group of very learned, learned people in the group. And as they were driving to the college campus where it was to be held, he confided to his chauffeur, who by that time had become a good friend. He says, I don't know if I can do this. He says, I'm so tired. He says, I've given all these speeches. He says, I'm afraid I'm going to get up in front of that audience, and I'm afraid I'm going to kind of keel over. The chauffeur, being a very empathetic guy, said, well, sir, he says, I want you to know you're going to do good tonight. I just know you're going to do good. You're going to get through it. Everything's going to go well. And the scientist who was sitting back in the chauffeur's car says, I'm not sure I can do it. And so the chauffeur tried to encourage him. He says, your speech is wonderful. I've heard it 42 times. <laughs> he says, it's a wonderful speech. I know it by heart. And all of a sudden, there was the creative moment. And the scientist said, would you be willing to give my speech for me tonight? <laughs> and so they pulled into a service station, and the chauffeur said, sure. And so the chauffeur put on the business suit, and the scientist put on the chauffeur's uniform, and off they went to the speech. The chauffeur, now in the nice suit, got up in front of the august group of people and delivered just line by line because he had it memorized. And it was a terrific speech. And he was going off, and there was nice applause in the crowd. And all of a sudden, something happened that he was not expecting. And the master of ceremonies says, Dr. So-and-so, would you please come up? I'm sure we have questions from the audience. And wouldn't you know it, right up here in front was somebody who wanted to show how smart he was and how dumb the speaker was. And so he raised a very convoluted scientific question. Uh, and of course, the chauffeur, now in the business suit, didn't know a thing that he was talking about. But he got, became composed. He thought about it for a minute. And he said, sir, I'd like to have you sit down, if you would, please. I've been on this tour now for two months, and I've heard hundreds and hundreds of questions and I want to say that's one of the most simple questions that has been asked of me on this tour. <laughs> Why, that question is so elementary, probably everybody in this room could answer that question. <laughs> and just to prove my point, sir, I'm going to call up my chauffeur to answer the question for you. the power of creativity, okay? Within all of us, there is that spark of creativity, whether you're 20 or whether you're 80 years of age. 
The second thing I learned over and over again is the power of listening. I got to put a plug in here for our August meeting. One of my colleagues, Manny Stiles, who has an international reputation in the field of listening, is going to be our speaker. And I want to tell you, you want to come here, Manny. You really want to come here, and Manny. But one of the things I've learned is how important it is to listen. <laughs> I'd like to tell you that that was planned. <laughs> that was not planned. That was not planned. No, I've lost my way. Yeah, totally. You ask most people, are you a good listener? OK, are you a good listener? Most people would say, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I listen pretty good. I want to tell you, folks, most of us are terrible listeners. I want to say to you guys out there in particular, you think you can multitask all the time. You can pet the dog, you can read the sports section of the paper, you can watch television, and you can even talk to your wife. Most wives will tell you it doesn't happen quite like that. Now, why are we, why are we poor listeners? Why is it? Well, one of the reasons is we're preoccupied. And so if you got up this morning and you kind of had a run-in with your teenage son or daughter, you may be thinking about that. If you are thinking about a meeting that you have this afternoon, and for good reason, it may be a very important meeting. If the speaker is a little dull, where do your thoughts go? They go to the meeting this afternoon. It is so hard to be in the present, to be in the present. And yet when you're in the present, you are really truly in the moment. Now, I'm sure when Manny talks to us in August, he's going to give us some good information on how to improve our listening skills. But I want to tell you, one of the most important things is we've got to get rid of the noise in our life. And the noise in our life is what keeps us from concentrating on the person that we're talking to. I can tell you with students, they know within 20 seconds when they come into my office whether they've got my undivided attention or not. It's amazing what happens when we get rid of the noise in our lives. I always, with my wife, wanted to go to New York City at Christmas time. And you might want to put it on your bucket list that at Christmas time, some year, you want to go to Rockefeller Center, to go to the Rockettes, to go to the Today Show, to see that magnificent, magnificent tree. I don't know any city where I felt as safe as I did in New York City at Christmas time. We had a great time. It was two days just before Christmas. We went to LaGuardia. And I was informed that um, the plane was going to be late. And indeed, the 8 o'clock plane was going to be taken off at 3.15 in the afternoon. All of us have had that experience, right? You go to the airport, and you're late. What are you going to do? You're going to read the paper. You're going to get some coffee. You're going to do whatever. And I uh, hope a book is available to read and kill some time. Well, it was a long day. And I was sitting, and I was watching people as they were going by. It was Christmas time. And I noticed how few people looked cheerful. How few people look joyful. I remember a mom pulling two kids, like five and three or something like that, along, and they were crying. And I thought, my goodness, there's no spirit of Christmas here in this airport. And then all of a sudden, a black gentleman stepped forth from the gate of Southwest Airlines. And he went right in front of the ticket place. And he began singing, Oh, Holy Night. A holy night. And that whole ring of that airport just absolutely rang with his beautiful, beautiful voice. And I want to tell you, about 90% of those people who were flurrying around stopped. And they just listened. A holy night. And then he was done. And there was absolute silence. And then everybody broke out into a round of applause. It was like for a brief moment the divine had just kind of come into a secular place, LaGuardia Airport, and all of a sudden that noise, that noise, how am I going to get to the plane? Is it going to be on time? How do I take care of my kids? All that stuff, all that noise dissipated. And all of a sudden the thing that is so important at this time of the year became evident. If you want to improve your listening skills, it really means that you've got to get rid of the noise. And what that means is that when you're sitting down with your staff, 
that at that staff meeting when somebody is speaking, that person becomes the most important person in your life. It is being in the moment. Now I'm going to say a word to you about those of you who are in the private sector, those of you who work in companies. Now your mission statement will have many, many wonderful things, that you exist to serve others, that you exist to produce products that others are going to use, that you want to have a great workplace for people. And so all those things are true, but the bottom line is your company has to make money, right? You're not going to be in existence unless you make money. I want to tell you, you've got to focus in on the millennials. You've got to focus in on those that are 20 to 30 years old, because if they are in your company, they're going to give you a perspective on your issues at your company that you're not going to get from those who are 50 or 60 years old. And it's not that those perspectives from those that are older are invalid or irrelevant. They've got wisdom. They've got history there. But what you want to focus on is this new generation. The new generation is coming up. And also, you want to make sure that the people that your company is serving and selling products to, that you know what's going on in their, um, in their life. Now, something has been stolen from me up here, and it's a prop of tuna fish. Where is it? Right underneath. underneath. Okay, hold on here a minute. I thought somebody left it over. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, Don was fearful that we were going to run out of food. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I brought with me a can of tuna fish. How many of you were kind of raised on tuna fish sandwiches? Oh, look at that. Look at that. Well, I want to tell you. I want to tell you. People are not eating tuna fish anymore, at least not like they were. And the group that is not eating tuna fish anymore are the millennials, those who are 20 to 30 years old. And so you might give them a can of this for Christmas as <laughs> your Christmas gift, and they'll look at it, and they will say, this is a strange kind of a thing. And so why will millennials not purchase tuna fish ideas? They, you get the A. You get the A. Did you hear that over there? They want it in a pouch. There's the second good. Okay, here's the answer. They don't own can openers. They don't own can openers. And so, yes, Judy. It is a factor. I don't know if you heard that back there, but you know, uh, you, the young is more environmentally conscious about animals, animal rights, making sure they want fresh foods, okay? They tend not to want processed food. But what the, uh, three companies discovered in interviewing uh, millennials is that they want things fast. They want things in a pouch. They want things in a packet. And so if you go to your grocery store and say, I want some uh, can of tuna fish, and you look around, now gradually you're going to see these things go out of existence and what you're going to find are very quick things that you can get into. Now use that illustration because no matter what your product is, those of you who work in profit-oriented organizations, no matter what it is you're selling, you've got to be in touch with the 20 to 30 year olds because they not only can help you in terms of what your market's going to be, but they can help you in terms of what your policies and your procedures should be. And so the second thing I learned again and again is the power of listening. The third thing I learned over and over again, and this will not surprise anybody who's an optimist, is the power of a genuine, a genuine Thank you. You know, I had a little rough time getting started in my academic career. Uh, the first year, my teaching evaluations were absolutely abysmal. I was kind of ashamed of them. And uh, I wondered whether I could ever be a teacher. I frankly wondered whether I could. I had a wonderful advisor, Bill Howell, and I went in to see Dr. Howell, and I said, I'm embarrassed by my teaching evaluations, but I want to show them to you. And he took a look at them, and 
He said, well, he says, they are kind of bad, aren't they? And I says, yes, and then he raised the question. He says, how often do you thank your students? That was kind of jarring. I mean, I thought it was the other way around. They're supposed to be thanking the professor. And he says, no, I'm sure. How often do you thank your students? And I says, I don't do it hardly at all. And he says, I'm going to give you a few tricks of the trade. He says, when you get papers and you're grading them, don't write up on the right-hand corner how many they got wrong. Write up how many they got right. And at the end of the paper, at the end of the test, you put down, if they did well, congratulations. I want to take you out for a cup of coffee because you did so well. And if they did poorly, what you write down on that end of the test, you say, I know this didn't go so good with you, but I'm in your corner, and I want to help you. And I know the next test is going to go better. Let me know how I can help. I tell you, it was the most important lesson that I learned in graduate school, the power of a thank you. Now, folks, we're optimists in this club. That's why we come. That's why we enjoy it, because we believe in the process. We believe in optimism. But I want to tell you, all of us could probably do a better job of saying thank you, of saying thank you. We live in a culture which is dying to hear those words, if I may put it that way. I was working for an organization not too long ago. It was a seminar. It was four hours in length. It was on the morning. It was at the company's headquarters. And there was a young lady who was sitting right in front. In the first two hours, boy, she was engaged. I mean, she was totally engaged. She was taking notes, and she was asking questions. And she was my A student for those two hours. We took a 20-minute break, and people mixed and mingled, and they went out. And I saw this young woman coming down the aisle. And as she came down the aisle, she was reading a letter. And she kept reading it, and I started lecturing for the next two hours. And I tell you, she, she wasn't engaged. Her mind was elsewhere. She was looking at that piece of paper over and over and over again. And at times, I could see her just kind of drifting off in space, looking. And I knew she wasn't engaged anymore. The seminar was over, and I saw her, and I looked at her, and I could see a troubled expression on her face. And I said, I don't mean to, and I don't mean to ask something that's not appropriate. But I said, the first two hours, you were so engaged. I mean, you were, you were asking questions. The second two hours, you were focused on a piece of paper. I said, what was going on? And she says, at break, I went to my post box. And she says, I pulled out my letter from my boss. And it was my performance review for this past year. And immediately I thought, man, this must be a pretty perform bad performance review. And she said, I'd like to have you read it. And I said, well, I don't know. She said, no, I want you to read it. And so the letter went like this, dear Miss so-and-so, very formal. Thank and she said, dear Miss so-and-so, uh, during this past year, there were three projects that you were involved in. Project one, project two, project three. As you know, our company right now is going through difficult financial times, and we are not giving raises to anybody. Sincerely, the director of human resources. And I said to her, well, I guess you're really sad because, because there's not going to be a raise. She looked at me, and her eyes welled with tears, and she says, no. She said, all I wanted was a simple thank you. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted was a simple thank you. The power of a thank you, if it's genuine, means everything. Now, you just can't say thank you. You got to say, I am thankful because of the report that you gave to our staff. I am phased an important question. I am thankful that you're always here early in the morning to help. I'm thankful that you tend to coffee. And you make sure that everybody's got coffee in the morning. I'm thankful for a very specific thing. Now, I want to digress a minute here, but this is terribly, terribly important. And that is, you never want to think that because you don't get a thank you, that people aren't grateful. It's one of the hardest lessons to learn, that just because you don't get a thankful comment, that people aren't grateful. There's probably not one of us in the room who's had not had the experience of, of wondering whether anybody cares. Does anybody care what I'm doing? Does anybody know how hard I'm working? 
Does anybody really know and value what it is that I'm doing? And I would say that all of us in our careers have had those moments. I want to tell you, even when you never get that word, thank you, it doesn't mean that people are not grateful. I want to tell you about an interesting class I taught. Most of my classes come to life. They're spontaneous. The students are a little rowdy, what have you. It's all good, 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 good. But I had a class that, that really wasn't that way. They were kind of very uh, emotionally flatlined, if I might say. And I, as a teacher, tried to do everything I could to get them energized, to put some energy into the room. And all the things I tried didn't work. Although I would say they did pretty darn well on the mid-semester exam, and I was kind of surprised. But they didn't interact. I didn't feel the energy. And I remember saying to my wife, Karen, before I was going to my last class, boy, I'm glad to get this last class over with. And as I was driving to the University of Minnesota, I thought to myself, you know, I have never said that before, that I'm happy that this class is over. But I met the class, and I said to him, I wish you well. And I said, that's the end of the class. And the class just sat there. They just sat there. And I looked down at them, and I said, folks, th this is it. I mean, the, the class is over. You can go. And they just sat there. And a woman who is a Muslim was way in the back row, and she stood up. And she was in really beautiful Muslim garb. And it was uh, garments made of, of, of a cloth where the purples and the reds just absolutely shone. And she stood up and she said, Dr. Veninga, she said, may I come up to the front of the class? And I said, yes. And I wondered, what in the world is going on? And she walked up into the front of the class and she handed me a plaque that was embroidered. And she said, on the plaque, embroidered, I thank you from the bottom of my Ethiopian heart for this class. And then she said, turn it over. And all the students had wrote, written a little note about what the class meant for them. It was the only time in 34 years, folks, that I wept in front of a class because I knew I'd misjudged them. Just because people don't thank you does not mean, folks, that they aren't grateful. The fourth thing that I learned, and oh my goodness, the power of laughter. Mark Twain had it right. The human race has only one really effective weapon, and that is laughter. I've learned again and again how important it is not to take yourself seriously, and especially when you're around the millennials. I have a file at home, and I have labeled it Funny things that have happened to me at the University of Minnesota. And in it, I have all kinds of notes, letters that students have written. And I hope during this coming year to have a new book out called Funny Things Happen in Academia. The other night, I was thumbing through it, and I found a letter from a spouse of a student that I taught. And I know from firsthand experience that when you get a letter from a spouse of a student, it always tends to be very special. And here's what she wrote to me. Dear Dr. Veninga, my husband took your management class last semester. He loved the class, but didn't like the textbook you selected for your class. He would bring it to bed every night and say, this is so boring. This is so boring. Today, I am six months pregnant, and I hold you personally responsible. <laughs> Yes, I'm just kidding, but I'm so excited. I'm telling everybody I know the good news. <laughs> you know, the people you want to befriend are eccentrics, OK? I want to just say that. You want to, you want to befriend eccentrics, people who are just a little off the grid, if you might, because they add energy and they add spice. And I've had so many eccentric students, but I've got to tell you about one. This is amazing. Many you'll appreciate this. Um, this is the beginning course of management. And so I got up in front of the class and I said, there aren't many names you're going to have to remember, but in this class there is one name you've got to remember, and it's the name Frederick Winslow Taylor. Frederick Winslow Taylor is the father of scientific management. The reason we have mission statements and performance review policies all goes back to Frederick Taylor. Well, the students kind of, you know, put it down. And I said, students, this is a really important person, Frederick Winslow Taylor. 
and I knew I wasn't getting too far, and so I pulled out the weapon that all teachers use at this time, and I said, students, it's going to be on the? Oh my goodness, did they write it down? Did they write it down? And so uh, it was the final exam. The last question was, who is Frederick Winslow Taylor, and why do we need to remember him? Everybody nailed it, except my eccentric student. And here's what he wrote on his exam. Who was Frederick Winslow Taylor, and why do I need to remember him? When I was growing up, Fred Taylor was my next door neighbor. <laughs> He was concerned about frogs that were overpopulating his lake. So he ate one every night to decrease the frog population. Today, Mr. Taylor burps a lot, but he can leap tall buildings with a single bound. Actually, I must have missed class on the day you lectured on Mr. Taylor. <laughs> a wonderful sidelight to that story. I gave him uh, one point for creativity, all right? And I bumped into him at a health executive conference. And he came up to me and he said, do you remember me? And I said, no, I never, I'm sorry, I really don't. He says, do you remember the student who didn't know who Frederick Winsor Taylor was? I am that student. And I looked at his badge, and he was an executive of a, of a major healthcare corporation. And I thought to myself, you know, being eccentric is not all bad at all. Now, the last point, and it's an important point, is the power of having a dream. Helen Keller was asked if there's anything worse than being born blind. Yes, she replied, being born without a vision. I want to say to all of us, it is important to have a dream. But the point that I want to make is that the older you get, the more powerful the dream must be for your life to sustain vitality, to sustain life, to sustain energy. And so, we know that it is important for a 20-year-old to dream about their career, who they're going to get married, and that's what we usually talk about. What I've learned in 34 years of teaching is that the older we get, the more powerful the dream should be. I love to collect examples of people who are fully living their lives out in retirement. And one of the reasons Karen and I joined this club is that there's such wonderful age groups in here. We've got 20-year-olds, we've got millennials in here, and we've got people in retirement that are doing amazing things in their life. I was in Florida not too long ago for a conference, and I happened to read about a gentleman who was 95 years old, get that, and he went out and celebrated by buying a brand new Camaro. Not only was it a Camaro, it was a red Camaro. Not only was it a red Camaro, it has a convertible uh, Camaro. And the most interesting thing part of the story is, at age 95, he took out the extended warranty. <laughs> Do you remember David Thomas, who founded Wendy's and advertised, had white hair? There's a wonderful story that was chronicled in Parade Magazine about him. And he was asked at his retirement, do you have any more dreams for your life? You know, here's a man who's a billionaire. And he says, yes, I want to finish high school. I want to finish high school. He had never finished high school. Two years later, at the age of 62, he finished high school. And his classmates named him the man most likely to succeed. <laughs> I close with this story. Last August, I wanted to get my car cleaned, and so I went up to my favorite car wash, a full-service car wash, to get it cleaned. There was hardly anybody else that was getting their car cleaned that day, and so, you know, you give the key fob to the attendant, and it comes down the line, and in this particular car wash, there's glass, so you can watch your car as it's being watched, and I was just kind of watching what was going on, and all of a sudden, I looked up, and as I, as I looked up, coming down this corridor from, uh, from above, where you hand the keys to the fob to the attendant, was the cleaning lady. And she was probably about 25 years old, 28 years old. And I want to tell you, she seemed happy. 
And she was whisking that mop around, I tell you, back and forth, back and forth. And as she came closer to me, I could hear her sing. I could hear her sing. And as she came to me, I said, you're really happy today, aren't you? And she says, I really am. She says, I feel so blessed. I feel so blessed today. And she kept repeating it. I feel so blessed today. And I said to her, well, that's wonderful. Can you tell me what you're blessed about? Oh, no. She says, I can't tell you. She says, that's a secret. I can't tell you why I'm blessed. But I feel so blessed today. And so she continued mopping, and she went back over spots. And so I was waiting for my car. My car was called. I was leaving. And she came down the, the corridor, and she says, sir, I just got to tell you why I feel so blessed. I feel so blessed because I interviewed for a public relations job at a technology company yesterday. Now, mind you, she was cleaning the floor. She interviewed for a public relations job yesterday, and she says, I just got a text. I'm one of two finalists, and I'm going to be interviewed this afternoon. And then she paused with a big smile, and she said, I know I am going to get the job. She was blessed. I have never seen her again at the car wash <laughs> because I'm sure she got the job. I want to tell you, feeling blessed is the fuel, is the fuel that drives our dreams. It's easy for most people to say, this is what I'm dreaming about in my life. I want to be the best grandparent I can be. I want to be the best supervisor I can be. I have some plans for travel. I mean, that's relatively easy, but you need fuel. You need fuel in order to fulfill that dream. And I want to tell you, folks, the fuel, the fuel that fulfills your dreams is feeling grateful and blessed. So in this very holy time of the year, my greatest wish for all of us in this room is that no matter what has happened in the past, no matter what we may face in the future, that at this moment we all feel blessed. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Boinga. It, it's really an amazing story. It's a great one for the holiday season. And I do want to give to you, grab the wrong thing here, here someplace, sorry. I have for you a copy of the Optimist Creed that I'm sure you'll keep close and, and you'll try to memorize in the next couple of weeks. But I'm also very happy and thankful that you were here today and give us these lessons because they're very important, because it's a real part of optimism. But I think also I'm really happy today that his chauffeur was sick and unable to attend, so we actually got the real deal. So thank you very much for being here. Have a very happy holiday. Thank you.